Red Army tank crews looked on intently as mechanics arrived carrying steel meshes. They began to fix them to their tank's hull and turret. It seemed a flimsy kind of armor, but this experiment could save the tank crew's lives. As Soviet tanks advanced into German towns and cities in the spring of 1945, they were regularly ambushed by German Panzerfaust teams. The Wehrmacht was running out of trained soldiers. They had been forced to conscript teenagers and old men. But even in their hands, the Panzerfaust could be just as lethal as a tank. commander of a Soviet guard's tank regiment described the aftermath. Here's a tank standing with the hatches buttoned down. There's a small hole burnt through the turret, just wide enough to put your little finger in. This is a Panzerfaust's work. We have to weld off the hatch, which is locked from inside. We pull four dead men from the turret. A hollow charge round has burnt through the armor, and the spitting of melting metal has killed them all. Engineers believed steel meshes could protect Soviet tanks by causing the Panzerfaust warhead to explode before it reached the tank's armor. The report read, the surface of the mesh was torn and bent as a result of the impact there was a hole in the tank's sloping armor plate. It went right through. So the Panzerfaust could kill a T-34 even if it was cloaked in the protective mesh. Nonetheless, many tank crews adopted this new measure. In this bitter fighting, they were willing to try anything that gave them an added chance of survival. On the 31st of January, 1945, Tanks of the 1st Belarusian Front reached the Oder River near Kustrin and Frankfurt and der Oder. They crossed without waiting for the infantry to catch up. They had advanced 400 kilometers across Poland. 35 destroyed enemy divisions and hundreds of thousands of prisoners lay in their wake. They were now just 100 kilometers from Berlin, the lair of the Nazi beast. But now, the Stavka Soviet High Command ordered a halt. The frontline troops needed resupply and rest before they were ready to begin the final assault. In March 1945, Pomerania to the north and Silesia to the south were cleared of German troops. The flanks were secure for the drive on Berlin. The Germans attempted a counterattack at Kustrin, but it ended in complete failure. In the process, some of the last armored forces available for the defense of Berlin were destroyed. From his Führer bunker beneath the Reich Chancellery, Hitler raged at this latest failure. He was particularly scathing of the commander of the 9th Army, Theodore Busa. But when Chief of the General Staff Heinz Guderian stood up for Busa, Hitler's wrath fell on him instead. Guderian was sent on leave, effectively enforced retirement. His successor was General Hans Krebs. Hans Krebs had been a military attaché in Moscow when the war began. More recently, he'd been chief of staff for Modal's Army Group B, which that winter had launched the Ardennes Offensive against the Western Allies. During his career, Krebs had shown a talent for planning defensive operations. Now, Hitler expected a miracle from him in Berlin. 
As Guderian packed his bags, an old acquaintance of his was preparing for the final push on Berlin. He was the Soviet general Semyon Krivoshein. The two men had met in September 1939 in Poland during the Nazi-Soviet carve-up of the country. Semyon Moseyevich Krivoshein began his military career in 1918 with the cavalry. In 1939, as part of the Nazi-Soviet partition of Poland, his brigade occupied Brest in modern Belarus. This was when Krivoshein met Guderian, the German general responsible for handing over control of the city to the Soviets. In 1945, Krivoshein commanded the 1st Mechanized Corps. It was the only unit of the 1st Russian Front to be completely equipped with American Sherman tanks. 1st Mechanized Corps was on the eastern bank of the Oder River, but every night its soldiers crossed the river to help dig emplacements for guns and tanks. On the night of the 15th of April, the Corps crossed the Oder to take up these prepared positions. As Hitler ranted and raved at his generals, commander of the 1st Russian Front, Marshal Zhukov, was summoned to Moscow. He and Stalin were to discuss details of the final assault on Berlin. Zhukov had prepared two plans for the offensive on the German capital. Plan A envisaged a thrust from the Kustrin bridgehead. Plan B from the bridgehead near Frankfurt. The Germans would be kept guessing as to which was the real line of advance, forcing them to disperse their troops. But bad news awaited Zhukov in the Kremlin. In his memoirs, he described a late-night meeting with Stalin. He was told, the German front in the West has completely collapsed. The Germans don't seem to be willing to take any measures to stop the advance of the Western Allies. British and American troops had crossed the Rhine. They had destroyed German Army Group B on the Ruhr. Their armoured divisions were advancing rapidly towards Berlin. Although the Allies had agreed at Yalta that Berlin would be in the Soviet zone of occupation, the Western Allies hadn't ruled out entering the city before the Red Army. Winston Churchill had expressed his opinion to the American president. Russian armies will no doubt enter Vienna. If they also take Berlin, Will not their impression that they have been the overwhelming contributor to our common victory be unduly imprinted in their minds? I therefore consider that should Berlin be in our grasp, we should certainly take it. Zhukov understood. He put forward the plan that could be implemented most rapidly, a single assault from the Kustrin bridgehead. Marshal Konyev, commander of the 1st Ukrainian Front, also flew to the Stavka headquarters in Moscow. In his memoirs, Konyev recalled, the chief of staff read aloud a telegram, the point of which was that the Western Allies were preparing an operation to capture Berlin. Stalin addressed Zhukov and myself. So, who is going to take Berlin? Are we or are the Allies? I was the first to answer. We shall take Berlin, and we'll take it before the Allies. The general staff worked night and day as they planned the operation. One of the directives received by the 1st Russian Front ran as follows. After the German defences have been breached, tank armies are to be introduced on the line of the main thrust to enable the envelopment of Berlin from the north and northeast. The purpose of this maneuver was to block the Western Allies' eastward advance on Berlin. The prize was not for sharing. Zhukov planned to deliver the main thrust through the Seeloff Heights, held by General Weidling's 56th Panzer Corps. Then the Soviet armies would race west and establish a perimeter in the suburbs of Berlin. This cordon would prevent German forces retreating into the city. 
Konyev was unhappy that he was not making the main assault on Berlin. Instead, his front would encircle the city from the southwest. But Konyev ordered his staff to prepare two plans, one following the Stavka's directives, the other planning a quick dash to Berlin. Meanwhile, in Berlin, life went on. Most services continued to run, including public transport. In response to the air raids, many had volunteered to help with firefighting or to help clear debris. There were still films and concerts, but over everything hung a sense of fear, a fear of what was to come. Berlin bore the unmistakable scars of war, cratered streets and scorched, ruined buildings. Now Berliners helped to build barricades as the city prepared to defend itself. Berlin's barricades were made of wood, stone and rails. They could be up to 2.5 meters high and 4 meters thick. They made many streets completely impassable and the approaches to them were mined. Immobilized tanks were dug in at crossroads and became fixed gun emplacements. Berlin also boasted three massive flak towers, built to defend the city from Allied air raids. These were 40 meters high and bristled with anti-aircraft artillery. Many Berliners now wore the armband of the Volkssturm, the German equivalent of the Home Guard. These units were controlled not by the army, but by the Nazi party. The Volkssturm was formed in October 1944, after Hitler ordered the mobilization of all German males between the age of 16 and 60. By 1945, this meant the conscription of the only men left, teenagers, invalids and the elderly. The Nazis hoped to create a fanatical people's militia, but most had little stomach for a one-sided fight with the Red Army. There were very few weapons available for these units. Some received Italian or Dutch rifles with just a few cartridges. But there were plenty of Panzerfausts. The Panzerfaust was a one-shot disposable launcher that fired a hollow-charge anti-tank warhead. It was very cheap and easy to make. The Germans produced more than six million of them between 1943 and the end of the war. The most common version, the Panzerfaust 60, had an effective tank killing range of 60 meters. Its warhead traveled at 45 meters per second and was able to penetrate 200 millimeters of armor. This was very bad news for Soviet tank crews. The front armor of a T-34 medium tank was just 45 millimeters and of an East II heavy tank, 120 millimeters. Standing between Zhukov and the capital of the Third Reich were four German armies. They consisted of nearly a million soldiers, more than a thousand armored vehicles, and almost 10,000 guns and mortars. More than 200 Volkssturm battalions were formed into the Berlin Army Command Reserve. The Berlin garrison itself totaled more than 200,000 men. Busser was extremely cynical about their prospects. We will consider our task fulfilled, he wrote, if American tanks strike us in our back. The German general staff believed the fate of Berlin would be decided on the Seeloff Heights. Therefore, most troops were committed to the front rather than held back inside the city. On the 15th of April, a proclamation from the Führer was read out to the troops. Berlin will remain German. Vienna will remain German, and Europe will never be Russian. Form a single community to defend not the empty word fatherland, but your families, your wives, your children, and hence your own future. The slogan, Berlin will remain German, appeared, daubed on walls around the city. 
many still believed that somehow the city could be saved. Troops of the first Belarusian front were addressed by their commissar. Our troops have travelled a difficult but glorious road. Our battle standards are covered with glorious victories, won at Stalingrad and Kursk, on the Dnieper and in Belarusia, at Warsaw and in Pomerania, in Brandenburg and at the Oder. With our own sweat and blood, we have earned the right to assault Berlin, to be first to enter the city. To Berlin! At 3 a.m. on the 16th of April, 1945, more than 7,000 guns, mortars and Katyusha rocket launchers began an earth-shaking bombardment of the German line. It was one of the greatest concentrations of firepower ever seen. In Berlin, the bombardment was heard like the sound of distant thunder. In houses closer to the front, pictures fell off walls and windows shattered. In Munchenberg, the cross tumbled from the church spire. Amongst the guns were six massive 280mm mortars from the 34th Independent Battalion of Heavy Artillery. When the bombardment stopped, 150 giant searchlights were switched on, pointed straight at the German lines. The searchlights were Zhukov's idea. They were supposed to light the way and dazzle the German defenders. But they struggled to penetrate the thick morning mist and the smoke and dust thrown up by the barrage. The searchlights proved just as effective at dazzling their own men. And many were silhouetted by the lights, becoming easy targets for the Germans. The Germans had known the initial bombardment would be massive. So most of their troops had already been withdrawn to the second line. This allowed Soviet troops to advance the first few kilometers with relative ease. As the sun rose, the searchlights were turned off. Despite the early success, it was clear by afternoon that there had been no immediate breakthrough. The Silov Heights were defended by a network of machine gun nests and gun emplacements. It was a slow and bloody process for the Soviet infantry to fight their way through. The advance of the first Belarusian front was supported by 800 Soviet aircraft. Unchallenged by the Luftwaffe, they arrived overhead to batter the German positions. By 1 p.m., Zhukov explained, I clearly understood that the enemy's defensive fire system was intact. So to reinforce the attacking troops and ensure a breakthrough, we decided to feed both tank armies into the battle. His decision created huge traffic jams on the approaches to the Silov Heights. Tanks, artillery tractors and supply trucks all struggled to get forward. By committing his tank armies to the battle, Zhukov had altered the plan that he'd agreed with the Stavka. It showed desperation, and Stalin was not happy. He rang Zhukov to reprimand him for this unauthorized use of the tank reserve, and he demanded to know when the breakthrough would be made. Zhukov tried to remain calm. The enemy's defences at the Silov Heights 
will be breached tomorrow, he told Stalin. Now, Zhukov had to make it happen. Zhukov's advance, led by Chuikov's 8th Guards Army and Katakov's 1st Guards Tank Army, was faltering on the Silov Heights. Meanwhile, Marshal Konyev's 1st Ukrainian Front was advancing towards the Nysa River and the forests southeast of Berlin. The Germans had no forces here able to withstand his assault. On the evening of the 17th of April, Konyev informed Stalin that he was ready to send two tank armies to help Zhukov. Stalin thought about it for a moment. Then he agreed. Very good, he said. Direct the tank armies towards Berlin. Konyev immediately issued orders to Rybalko's 3rd Guards Tank Army and Lila Yushchenko's 4th Guards Tank Army to turn towards Berlin. At the Nysa River, Rybalko's troops found a ford, no more than a metre deep. Rather than wait for bridging equipment, his tank crews made their vehicles watertight and drove straight across. By the third day of the offensive, tanks of the 1st Ukrainian Front were poised to break through the German defences. At the same moment, Zhukov's troops were at last about to break through German positions on the Silov Heights. General Krivoshein's motorized infantry had managed to capture an intact bridge at the town of Platkov. Now his first mechanized corps was advancing unchecked. Behind them rolled the T-34s of Bogdanov's Second Guards Tank Army. On the 20th of April, wrote General Weidling, commanding the German defence, our units, having suffered huge losses and exhausted to extremity, could no longer withstand the pressure of the Russian assault. Weidling's corps was outflanked on both sides. That evening, Zhukov entrusted General Semen Bogdanov with a historic mission to lead his second guards tank army into Berlin and to become the first Soviet troops to enter the enemy capital. The next day, Krivoshein's first mechanized corps, part of the second guards tank army, reached the Berlin suburb of Weissensee and fulfilled the mission. For this, Krivoshein received his nation's highest award, the title Hero of the Soviet Union. The main force of the 1st Belarusian Front was now sweeping around Weidling's shattered core and arriving en masse at the outskirts of Berlin. Konyev's dream of conquering Berlin had been thwarted. Forests and lakes, minefields and pillboxes had slowed his advance. There was hard fighting around Zossen, from where the Wehrmacht High Command had recently fled. But his advance had trapped 20,000 men of the German 9th and 4th Panzer Army in the forests south of Berlin. These men could no longer reach the city to help in its defence. Hitler faced a dilemma. Stay in the capital or flee to his Alpine fortress. He pinned his hopes on the army detachment of SS General Felix Steiner. Hitler telegraphed the general. The primary task before army detachment Steiner is to attack from the north. The fate of the capital of the Third Reich depends on how successfully you execute this mission. It was an impossible order that could not be carried out. 
When Hitler was told this, he flew into a rage, accusing the army of cowardice and treason. It's all over, he at last recognised. The Führer would stay in Berlin, but he clutched at one last straw, General Wenck's 12th Army facing the Americans on the Elbe River. On the 23rd of April, Wenck was ordered to relieve Berlin. But neither Steiner nor Wenck could save the capital. The Berlin garrison was formed from a host of shattered army and SS divisions, supplemented by Volkssturm battalions, police and air defence units, about 120,000 men in total. It was not enough, although many of the SS men were prepared to fight until the end. The Soviets outnumbered the Germans by more than four to one. And many Red Army soldiers were now battle-hardened veterans, graduates of the Stalingrad Academy of Street Fighting. Soviet tanks advanced on both sides of the street in a staggered double file. They kept 30 metres behind the infantry and used their main gun to take out defensive strongpoints that were holding up the advance. Infantry squads and snipers worked to flush out the German Panzerfausters. The Soviets knew that the Panzerfaust had a short range, about 60 metres. So tanks would pull up 150 metres from an enemy-held building and shell it from a safe range. When assault teams captured a building, they used smoke grenades to fill the street with smoke, allowing more troops to move up in safety. General Krivoshane's mechanised corps was redeployed to the northwestern suburbs. After crossing the River Spree, it joined up with Rybalko's 3rd Guards Tank Army to complete the encirclement of Berlin. The River Spree curled through the German defences. In places, the river was 200 metres wide. The Germans considered this an impenetrable barrier, and so the south bank was lightly defended. The appearance of Soviet motorboats was therefore an unpleasant surprise for the Germans. These boats of the Dnieper fleet had been transported by road and were now launched onto the spree. The amphibious assault succeeded in establishing a foothold across the river. Reinforcements were then quickly ferried in to shore up the position. This sudden advance, where it was least expected, threw the German defensive plan into chaos. Several blocks were given up without a fight as units raced back to avoid being cut off. The Red Army troops were all aiming for one spot, the Reichstag building. The Reichstag building was completed in 1894. In the interwar period of the Weimar Republic, it was where the lower chamber of the German parliament met. In 1933, shortly after Hitler came to power, it caught fire in suspicious circumstances. Hitler accused the communists of starting the fire as part of a plot against the government. The next day, the Reichstag fire decree gave the Nazi party emergency powers to deal with its political opponents. In effect, 
it was the death of democracy in Germany. The Reichstag building no longer had a purpose. The center of government was now located somewhere else entirely, inside the Führer bunker, 25 feet beneath the garden of the old Reich Chancellery. The bunker had been built during the war in complete secrecy. By April 1945, it had become Adolf Hitler's permanent residence and the site of his military headquarters. According to those who experienced life inside the bunker, the place smelled of wet cement and there was a constant drone from the ventilation system. It was claustrophobic, but impervious to bombs and shells. The Red Army didn't know about the Führerbunker, even as their tanks fired onto the Reich Chancellery itself. The observation point of the 34th Battalion of Heavy Artillery was located in an elevator tower on Schlesingerstrasse. They couldn't see the Reichstag, only flames and smoke. On the 27th of April, their unit was ordered forward. As the artillery spotters looked for a new vantage point, their telephone rang. A voice demanded to speak to the senior officer. Sergeant Pavel Larin, commander of the scout section, was given the phone. 18th orders you to fire on target 21, said the voice. Target 21 was the Reichstag building. Sergeant Larin acknowledged the order. His battery hadn't fired on the Reichstag before, and Larin knew that there were Red Army troops just 300 meters from it. Firing from a range of three miles, the smallest mistake in their calculations could end up killing their own comrades. Larin also knew that any delay in the fire mission would not be forgiven. The BR-5 heavy mortar fired an anti-concrete round that weighed 246 kilograms and carried 58 kilograms of explosive. This shell made a crater 10 metres wide and 6 metres deep. The battery fired 42 shells, one after another. Then the phone rang again. At the other end of the line, they were shouting to cease fire they'd been hitting their own positions. The new order was to fire on Target 20. Target 20 was the Reich Chancellery. The battery fired 18 rounds. The forward unit came back on the phone. Good shooting. I officially thank you on behalf of the assaulting units. Pavel Larin had just played his small part in the fall of Berlin. The Soviet Third Shock Army was leading the race to the Reichstag. Its commander was Vasily Kuznetsov, the same Kuznetsov who'd faced the Germans on the first day of the war, near the Belarusian town of Grodno, as he struggled to save his third army from encirclement. His war looked like it would finish in the Baltic, where he'd been a deputy front commander. Then, in March 1945, Zhukov clashed with Nikolai Simonyak, commanding the third shock army. It was just two weeks before the Berlin operation. The experienced Kuznetsov was flown in as a replacement. The third shock army had fought its way through the northern suburbs of Berlin. 
Now, Kuznetsov's men were just 800 meters from the Reichstag building. The first attempt on the Reichstag took place on the 29th of April. But the attacking troops were fired on from the rear by Germans in the Kroll Opera House. So first, the Opera House had to be cleared. Soviet infantry attacked again at 11.30 a.m. on the 30th of April. They were supported by artillery fire falling directly onto the Reichstag building. At 10.30 p.m., the victory banner finally flew above the Reichstag building. Previous morning, Hitler had spoken with Major General Monka, commanding the defence of the Berlin Central Sector. He asked him, how long will you be able to hold out? 20 to 24 hours maximum, came the reply. That evening, Hitler ordered a report on the status of Wenck's 12th Army. The answer came at 1 a.m. Wenck had been forced to abandon his attempt to relieve Berlin. 14 hours later, Hitler shot himself. His body was carried to a shell hole outside the entrance to the Führer bunker, covered in petrol and burned. Under a white flag, a delegation led by Chief of the General Staff Hans Krebs approached the Soviet lines. They were taken to see General Chuikov at 8th Guards Army headquarters. Krebs informed Chuikov of Hitler's death and the formation of a new German government under Grand Admiral Dönitz. But Chuikov refused to negotiate. His demands were simple and to the point. He wanted the immediate and unconditional surrender of the Berlin garrison. The Germans refused. The fighting went on. After returning from his failed negotiations, General Krebs committed suicide in the Führer bunker on the 1st of May. It fell to General Weidling to surrender the Berlin garrison and end the fighting. Weidling contacted the Soviets by radio. Please cease fire. We will send truce envoys to the Potsdam Bridge at 12.50 p.m. Berlin time. The arrangements of the surrender were agreed at these brief negotiations. At about 6 a.m. the next day, the 2nd of May, the headquarters of the Berlin garrison crossed the front line and surrendered. From captivity, Weidling issued his last order. On the 30th of April, the Führer committed suicide, thus abandoning those who had sworn loyalty to him. The situation makes further resistance meaningless. I order the immediate cessation of resistance. This order was relayed through loudspeakers. The Germans began to put down their weapons. The Battle of Berlin was one of the largest battles in history. About three and a half million men fought on both sides. During the campaign, Red Army soldiers liberated hundreds of thousands of prisoners from German concentration camps. Amongst them were more than 200,000 foreign nationals. They included Edouard Herriot, the former Prime Minister of France, and General Otto Ruger, commander of the Norwegian army. On the 7th of May, the German instrument of surrender was signed at Reims in France. The signatories were the German General Alfred Jodl, US General Walter Smith, 
Soviet General Ivan Suslaparov and French General Francois Seves as the official witness. But the Soviet Union decided Suslaparov did not have proper authority to sign the surrender. It would have to be done again. And so, on the 8th of May, 10.43 p.m. Central European time, Field Marshal Keitel, representing the German army, General Stumpf of the Luftwaffe and Admiral von Friedeberg of the Kriegsmarine signed another act of surrender in Berlin in the presence of Marshal Georgi Zhukov and Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder. On the 9th of May, the Red Army entered Prague. On the 10th of May, the Red Army occupied the Hell Peninsula in the Danzig Bay. And on the 11th of May, German Army Group Courland finally surrendered. In these last days of the war, 1.2 million German soldiers were taken prisoner, including 101 generals. On the 24th of June, a victory parade was held in Moscow's Red Square. Marshal Rokossovsky commanded the parade. Marshal Zhukov inspected the troops. Thus ended the great patriotic war of the Soviet people. Sergeant Pavel Larin never found out who 18th was, the voice who'd ordered him to fire on the Reichstag and Reich Chancellery. He was just thankful to have survived the war. On the morning of the 3rd of May, Larin was ordered to go to the Reich Chancellery and document the effects of their bombardment. The Berlin garrison had surrendered, but suddenly they came under fire from a machine gunner on a rooftop. Luckily, he missed. Larin wasn't allowed to enter the Reich Chancellery. It was being visited by Zhukov and the front commanders. The artilleryman made his notes and headed towards the Reichstag. It was difficult to get in there, too. The building was crowded with thousands of soldiers celebrating their victory. Then, standing on his comrades' shoulders, he wrote on the wall, Sergeant Pavel Larin.